audience. Um, today, I'm going to talk about our work on the multiplex imaging of nucleome architectures. Um, and uh, my name is Stephen Wang, and um, I joined the Yale Genetics Department of Cell Biology uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, and we're interested in, oh, okay, all right, how DNA is packaged in the nucleus. We know that uh, the interface chromatin is spatially organized uh, in the nucleus uh, of a cell, and at the very short length, scales DNA first wrap around these histone proteins to form these nucleosomes, right? And these are also known as 10 nanometer fiber. And then at a very large length scale, individual chromosomes act actually occupy distinct nuclear space during the interface of the cell cycle. And these are called chromosome territories or CTs. Um, and in the past decade, thanks to the invention of a, um, a sequencing based technique called Hi-C, we now know that at this length scale of about 100 to 1000 kb, there are these topologically associating domains or TADS structures. And um, these largely define the uh, scope of promoter enhancer interactions. Now, within a TAD, you basically have uh, sometimes promoter enhancer interactions, and sometimes the whole TAD is a, a giant loop itself. So these are regions on the genome that are consecutive and have a lot of self-interaction inside. And these structures are proposed to be building blocks to build up larger uh, chromosome structures. And when they do so, they seem to be sorted into uh, two compartments called the AB compartments. So A compartments is enriched with active chromatin and B compartment is enriched with inactive chromatin. And there are also other sequencing techniques uh, that profiled the association of chromatin with other nuclear components. For example, you will find that there are specific regions of the genome that are uh, proximal or in contact with the nuclear laminar, and these are and there are regions that are in contact with nucleolus, and these are uh, known as laminar associated domains or LADs, or nucleolus associated domains or NADs. And uh, we now have evidence actually the chromatin organization at each of these length scales uh, is at least associated with gene expression regulation. For example, regarding the TADs and compartments, uh, when people are studying the uh, limb development, the, the arm and hand dif differentiation, people found that that's mainly controlled by this Hox D gene locus. There are multiple genes in here. Um, and up and downstream of Hox D, there are two TADs. And when the TAD that's upstream spatially engages the host D locus in 3D, uh, you get hand differentiation. So those tissues becomes hand. When the TAT that's downstream of host D spatially engages the host D gene locus, you got arm differentiation. And so this example basically shows us um, the spatial assignment of a gene locus actually can change. And it can be assigned to the upstream or the downstream of a TAD. Uh, and this will change the gene expression pattern and leads to uh, different di differentiation result during uh, development. And regarding the compartments, here is an example. So here we're plotting the compartment scores of human chromosome 21 in two different cell types. And these compartment scores are basically like, if you've seen a blue bar, it's an active score. That means that TAD is compartment B. And if you've seen the red bar, that means compartment score is positive, and that TAD is in compartment A. And there are 34 TADs um, on human chromosome 21 along the x-axis here. And the x-axis is essentially the ID number of the TADs. And we see that the compartmentalization scheme between the human embryonic stem cell and this human lung fibroblast IMR90 cell, they are different. More specifically, TAD16 to 21 here are largely in compartment B in the human embryonic stem cell. However, in the lung fibroblast, they switch to compartment A. And this kind of compartment switching behavior has been shown in multiple biological processes, such as the cellular senescence, hormone response, uh, cultural differentiation of cells, and also cancer. And these compartment switches, they have been shown to be associated with gene expression changes. When you switch from B to A, it's more likely that the genes inside becomes more active. Uh, so there's a, a, a um, consensus or um, a, like a rising hypothesis in the field, which is saying the AB compartment organization 
uh, is actually one layer you know, of uh, gene expression control that could um, act on top of the other mechanisms such as promoting enhancer interactions. So uh, these examples also demonstrate the importance for us to understand the 3D genome organization. However, this topic historically has been a challenging task due to technical limitations. So there are two main techniques that people use when studying 3D genome organization. One is called the FISH, the other is high c Both are very powerful techniques. However, both have its uh, limitations. Um, and to quickly go over the two techniques, the FISH stands for fluorescence in situ hybridization. And in conventional DNA FISH, what you have are these oligonucleotide probes that are labeled with fluorescent dyes. And these oligonucleotide probes, they uh, have the reverse complementary sequence to their genomic target. And when you uh, do the heat denaturation, you can actually open up the target DNA double strand and your oligos can hybridize to them. And then with fluorescent microscopy, you can image and pinpoint where these labeled genomic loci are in the uh, nucleus. So this is intrinsically like a single cell technique and even single molecule technique. Uh, however, the challenge here is um, we can only detect a few genomic loci at a time, and that's because different genomic loci, they need to be distinguished with different fluorescence colors. Otherwise, you don't know their genomic identity. Um, and there are only uh, several uh, specially distinguishable fluorescent colors available for doing this. And of course, we can try to combine different colors to generate a like, combination uh, of colors into a pseudo color, um, but that's still not many. So um, in <laughs> essence, one can not easily get uh, systematic information uh, with this technique. And then that, sorry, there's some background. Um, some people didn't mute. Um, so um, we, can, we can see another technique is, is a, a high C, um, and that stands for a high throughput chromosome conformation capture. Um, and in this technique, what we have um, is essentially, uh, it's a chemical and sequencing based technique. And in the first step, um, it's relying on the fact that the DNA, uh, particularly in a, a eukaryotic uh, chromatin, is heavily coated by protein. And um, using chemical cross-linking, one can actually uh, cross-link the proteins that are holding the DNA sections that are making spatial contact. And then one can use restriction enzyme to cut them. And uh, with ligation, you can generate these novel junctions that indicates which DNA section is interacted with, with which, the, which DNA section. And then you can actually cut and pull down these novel junctions and the sequence them with high throughput sequencing. So the benefit of high C is it's really systematic as all other sequencing based technique. You get a whole genome, all parent of genomic loci in the genome, which one is interacting with which one. Um, however, the downside is, first of all, it measures uh, like a contact frequency between different genomic loci rather than um, the real 3D positions of these genomic loci uh, in space. And furthermore, uh, most of the um, implication, uh, 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 application of this is still based on a population average method. So I do have to say that there are multiple versions of a single cell um, uh, high C available now. However, um, most of the discoveries and the most widespread version of the technique is still based on population average to average many, many, many um, single cells to get a, a high C profile. So um, the key, technical limit here is then, how do we get real 3D position measurements in single cells and at the systematic level, right? So uh, basically a fish gives you 3D positions in single cell, but not really that systematic. And a high C is quite systematic, but not really in 3D and really requires population averaging. So to address this question, um, uh, because of this technical limit, there is actually a key biological question that has been uh, daunting for uh, many decades. That is, what is the 3D folding path of chromatin at length scales above the nucleosomes, all right? Uh, so previously we saw these tasks, these compartments, these chromosome territories, but essentially um, all of these are larger and larger blobs. What is the re really the 3D folding path of chromatin inside of all of these structures? So there is no good technique to answer that. And to address this limitation um, in, 
uh, oh, sorry, there are actually further questions. So it's one thing that we do this in cell culture, right? But what if we move to the uh, tissue, in the native tissue environment, how is genome enfolded in 3D uh, across the different lens scales that I have shown in single cells of different cell types and cell states, right? When you have a tissue environment, there is not just one cell type, really. And then how is the 3D genome folded in relation to other nuclear components, such as the nuclear laminar and the nucleolus? So previously, different sequencing techniques are required to profile the 3D folding of chromatin or its association with laminar nucleolus. Can we do these in the same cells so that we can study how the folding is related to the nucleolar and the laminar association? And finally, how are the 3D genome variations among the cell types or states associated with uh, gene expression changes? Um, so basically, how can we look at the 3D genome and the 3D transcriptomic? Uh, information together. Um, and to answer these questions, um, in this talk, I'm going to first introduce a technique uh, termed the chromatin tracing, and that is to directly trace the spatial organization of numerous genomic regions in individual chromosomes in single cells. So this is uh, the technique that uh, Professor Fan just mentioned that I co-developed when I was uh, a postdoc. And then I'm going to introduce another technique termed the MENA that we recently developed in my own lab to profile multi-scale chromatin folding, other nuclear architectures such as laminar and nucleolar association, and the numerous RNA species in single cells in tissue, in the same single cells in tissue. And in both cases, I'm going to talk about uh, our application of them to cell culture and to tissue, and uh, to talk about some 3D genomic and nucleomic findings from the studies. All right, so first of all, the first technique first. Um, the idea of chromatin tracing is that we have a DNA strand of chromatin, and we want to label numerous genomic loci, and we want to connect to them along the genomic map so we get the 3D folding pass. However, one challenge you see immediately is that if we simply label so many genomic loci, um, it's hard to know which one should be connected with which one. It's just many dots uh, in space. Um, and for, of course, like uh, as I mentioned before, one can try to use different color to distinguish them, but there is essentially not so many colors available, right? And then another issue is if you just label so many genomic loci as shown uh, on this sample image, so this is the nucleus of uh, uh, one of the lung fibroblast RNA-T cell, um, we see a patch uh, of fluorescence. That's because of the diffraction limit of uh, fluorescent microscopy. So uh, each geometric dot is actually not realized as a dot. It's actually in a large plate due to the diffraction of light uh, in light microscopy. So the fluorescence from all the genomic loci, they are all connected into this patch, and you cannot even resolve the individual genomic loci. So to tackle these two difficulties, what we end up doing, um, coming up with, is uh, this sequential imaging strategy. All right, so in this strategy, we'll first label one genomic locus, and we can actually pinpoint the uh, center position of this locus with very high accuracy uh, to the tens of nanometer, even nanometer precision. And then we have bleach this genomic locus and the label the next genomic locus on the genomic map. And then image it again, pinpoint in center position, bleach it. And we can connect it to the previous gene locus because we know by design they are next to each other on the genomic map. And after bleaching, we can label the next genomic locus again, and we can do this over and over and again until all the genomic loci of interest are sequentially labeled, imaged, pinpointed, and connected. And then you basically see the 3D folding paths of this chromatin, right? So this is basically chromatin tracing. And to put this into reality, um, we uh, developed it based on sequential, multiplex sequential fluorescence in situ hybridization. And here, to trace 34 tests along human chromosome 21, what we did is we first hybridized the library of these oligonucleotide probes to target all the tests, all the 34 tests of interest. And all these primary probes, they are labeled with fluorescent dyes. Um, so upon 3D fluorescence imaging, what we see is these two fluorescent patches on top of the nuclear background. And these two fluorescent patches correspond to the two copies of this chromosome 21 in this diploid 
uh, human lung fibroblast mRNA T cell. At this stage, we cannot see the chromosome traces yet, but after photo bleaching, we can apply two secondary probes that binds to the overhang regions on top of the primary probes. And these secondary probes are uh, labeled with different fluorescent colors. And at this point, if we do the 3D fluorescence imaging, we see two foci that are largely diffraction limited um, that basically corresponds to the center positions of these two targeted tags. And after photo bleaching, we can flow in two other secondary probes to label two other tags. So essentially, this way, the tags are imaged two at a time, and two all of them are sequentially imaged. And with their center position extracted and linked, we can extract the 3D folding paths of this very copy of chromosome. Um, and of course, here we're doing two color imaging simply to speed up the imaging acquisition. We can totally do this with one color, uh, or if you use small, uh, sorry, three colors, it will be even faster and with less hives, right? So, um, in the initial demonstration, we, we basically targeted this chromatin folding um, at the TAD to AB compartment to whole chromosome kind of lens scale. Uh, after this work was published, uh, several other labs, including my postdoc lab, also worked on like, improving the genomic resolution of this technique. And there are several other works uh, coming from different labs, uh, basically doing this at shorter length scale um, with higher genomic resolution um, and applying this to uh, not only mammalian cell culture, but also Drosophila embryos. So this work uh, in our lab is uh, done on a self-built automated imaging and flow system. It's, this is one of such systems that I built at Yale. Um, so you are not actually doing tens of rounds of fish hybridization and buffer, buffer exchange by hand. It's actually all done automatically by the machine. And when we had this working, the first thing we did is we actually tried to uh, do a comparison between our uh, imaging-based um, genomics approach, uh, 3D genomics approach to the high C approach, the sequencing based approach to validate uh, our technique. And to do that, we first averaged 120 copies of chromosome 21, and we got this mean spatial distance matrix. So on such a matrix, what you see, the individual elements, individual pixels are the mean spatial distance between two corresponding tags, and X and Y are the tag ID, and there are again 34 tests along chromosome 21. So you see the mean spatial distances. Um, and along on this matrix, we see kind of two features. One is near the diagonal line, there are some very short distances. That indicates if two tests are close to each other uh, on the genomic map, they are also close to each other in 3D space, which is expected because that's even true for a random walk polymer. It's a, basically a polymeric feature. However, another thing we see is like beyond the diagonal line, far away from the diagonal line, there are also features, right? And these features are essentially showing that there are long range interactions or repulsions even uh, between genomic loci. Uh, so those are really non trivial. And after we got this mean spatial distance matrix, we first set out to compare the mean distance between the tests with their corresponding high C contact frequency. And as I mentioned, uh, we would like to ask, does the mean spatial distance correlate with the high C contact frequency? People always assume they should, but it's actually never tested on a systematic level. And also, if they do correlate, what is the relationship between them? And can we get a calibration function that we can use to convert high C contact frequency to these distances, for example? And to answer these questions, uh, we basically plotted our mean spatial distance against the inverse the high C contact frequency. Uh, and we see that on chromosome 21, there is a very strong uh, correlation between the two measurements. And the same high correlation above 0.9 is, um, or close to 0.9 is also observed in chromosome 22 and chromosome 20 in the same cell line. And when we fit, a power law function, note this is a log log plot, so a straight line is actually in a power law function. When we fit a power law function to the relationship between the high C and the mean spatial distance, we find that the high C contact frequency is inversely proportional to the false power of the mean spatial distance. Um, based on a previous mean field uh, model, people were guessing that the 
power law function, the scaling factor here should be minus three. However, people also realize that, that uh, there may be some oversimplification in that model. And in the more realistic setting, the scaling factor should be, uh, the absolute value should be higher than three. And, but how much higher people don't know. And with our work, we showed it's actually minus four and it's actually quite consistently minus four across different chromosomes. So with these data, we basically show that the mean spatial distance indeed highly correlates with the high C contact frequency, and which leads to a calibration function that people can use to convert their high C distance to spatial distances, hopefully. And it's also uh, cross-validated our technique with high C. And now we can ask some biological questions. And here, just to go through uh, some of them, one thing we asked is about the AB compartment organization. So at the time when this work was published, it was actually previously unknown whether the AB compartments, they are real stable physical structures inside of individual copies of chromosome, or are they just a statistical trend? Um, so what I mean by that, so what I mean is, if this is the genomic map of a, a chromosome, and there are tests that are uh, in compartment B or in compartment A. What high C shows us essentially is uh, there are higher contact frequency or contact probability between pairs of compartment B tests, and there are higher contact probability between compartment A tests to each other. Um, but it's actually unknown. Do the AB compartments really stably exist in individual copies of chromosome? For example, one can imagine maybe in individual copies of chromosome, there are transient interactions among some pairs of A and some pairs of B. And in another copy, you may have transient interactions among other pairs of A and other pairs of B. And after population averaging, you see, oh, all the AA interactions are enriched and all the BB interactions are enriched. But they are actually never two compartments maybe in individual copies of chromosome. And furthermore, if the, the AB compartment organization is stable, it's also unknown how they are they spatially organized. Is it polarized like this, side by side, or is it radial? In fact, this is a kind of a popular model. People say that A uh, compartment should wrap around B, and there are even uh, some models saying that in the interface of a cell cycle, a whole chromosome is like a large tube, and you have B on the outside, uh, sorry, A on the outside and a B on the inside. Um, to test all of these hypotheses and answer these questions, we basically performed a compartment analysis of chromosome 21 with our data using the computational workflow that was actually previously introduced um, in high C. Um, and I'm not going to go in detail uh, of this computational workflow, but just I'm gonna tell you that this workflow is essentially extracting uh, the off-diagonal feature uh, from the whole chromosome mean spatial distance matrix. And I mentioned that this off diagonal feature, they are non-trivial, they actually indicate the AB compartment organization. So there are regions that are closer or further apart from each other than expected. And from this compartment analysis, we get this compartment score plot, um, and each tad is assigned to either compartment B or compartment A. But this analysis is still population average. We got this score based on population averaging data. Um, so we still don't know whether the AB compartments are stable in individual copies of chromosome. And to know that, we, here we plot actually two individual copies of chromosome. And here, uh, individual dots are the 3D positions of single tads. And uh, a blue dot means the tad is assigned to compartment B, and the red dot means it's assigned to compartment A. And from these two copies of chromosome, we immediately see that the AB compartments indeed they stably exist in these uh, single copies of chromosome and they're positioned in this polarized side-by-side -side kind of fashion. Um, and these two copies of chromosomes, they are actually rigidly rotated in space to best visualize this polarized organization. And to really quantify this polarization, we built this 3D convex house that uh, uh, enclose the, um, the A and B tats and we defined this value called the polarization index so that when the two compartments, uh, they're really polarized and separated in space, the polarization index is one. When there is a partial overlap between the two compartments, then the polarization is smaller than one, but higher than zero. When the one compartment is 
perfectly overlapping with the other, or when it's uh, really wrapping around the other, then the polarization index is zero. So based on this polarization index metric, we can apply that metric to single copies of chromosome 21, and we see that the observed polarization indices are really high, and many of them are actually exactly one, um, and many of them, they, are, they are significantly higher than the polarization indices from a randomization control, where the compartment assignment of the tests are randomized. So we checked two other chromosomes also, and we found that uh, the polarized organization of the AB compartments is preserved. And so this allows us to conclude that the AB compartments are stably existing individual chromosomes and, uh, and are organized in this polarized side-by-side -side kind of fashion. So this technique uh, not only have um, single cell resolution, it's actually also the single chromosome copy kind of technique, right? So if you if it's a diploid cell and two copies of the same chromosome have difference, uh, we actually can see that. And in this first work, we demonstrate that uh, with a study on the ac active versus inactive X chromosome. So in human, sorry, in um, female mammalian cells, the two copies of X chromosome actually are different. One of them undergoes this process called X inactivation. So uh, after that, all the genes are uh, uh, on the inactive X chromosome are largely transcriptionally silenced. Um, and the other copy, which have genes that still can uh, highly transcribe, is called active uh, X or XA. So this is a mechanism that helps to uh, balance the dose uh, uh, difference between a uh, male and a female cell. So a male cell only have one copy of X, uh, but female cells have two copies of X. And, but after the X inactivation, the um, a copy of X chromosome that's available for high expression is essentially one. Um, so um, it's, that's essentially its biological function. And people know before, the XI and XA, uh, they have different chromatin organization. For example, people know that uh, the inactive X chromosome is more compact than the active X chromosome. But with our technique, we can really trace the spatial folding of chromatin in the XA and XI. And to do that, uh, we combined the chromatin tracing with co-immunofluorescence, and here we're targeting using co-immunofluorescence uh, histone variant that's enriched in the inactive copies of X chromosome. So here you see in the primary hybridization of the chromatin tracing with the two patches of the uh, fluorescence that corresponds to the two copies of X chromosome, and the one of them is co-localizing with this uh, uh, co-immunofluorescence signal. And that is the inactive X chromosome, the other copy is XA. And after we uh, do the chromatin tracing, we can actually group the act active X and the inactive X and then plot the mean spatial distance matrices separately. And from this plot, we immediately see that uh, they do look different. And first of all, individual entries in the XI matrix often adopt a smaller value than the XA matrix. That means it's uh, uh, XI is more compact. So consistent with previous result. But another feature we see is that the XI is actually more homogeneous than the XA. Um, that actually means the XI chromatin folding is more intermixed. Um, consistently, we can plot this mean spatial distance between pairs of tests versus their genomic distance. Um, and we see it follows largely in a power law function. And XA gives you this power law function that has a scaling factor uh, power law of about one-fifth. Um, and the XI have this scaling factor that's below one-tenth. So by I, it looks like the, 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 the line here is almost flat. So that means uh, you can have two genomic loci that are close to each other on the genomic map or far apart from each other on the genomic map. They're going to have similar mean spatial distance. So uh, as I mentioned before, even a random walk polymer have this polymeric feature, the smaller genomic distance means it's smaller spatial distance. But XI is kind of losing that polymeric feature. And it's like all the tests are no longer connected. They're just randomly diffusing dots, and they are so intermixed. Now, when we do the compartment analysis, we see that XI and SA also form different compartments. And XI is largely segregated into these two uh, macro domains, people call it. 
uh, separated by this DXZ4 microsatellite sequence. And this was uh, consistent with several previous studies using a Leo specific high C uh, technique. And the XA is separated into two compartments that corresponds to the P and Q arms of the human X chromosome. And these X specific compartment organization are also stable in individual copies of the chromosome and organized in a polarized fashion. Although the extent of the polarized segregation for the XI compartments are much weaker than all the other chromosomes. Um, and that is consistent with the more intermixed organization of XI, we think. So this leads us to conclude that the X active and the inactive X chromosome adopt drastically different folding and compartmentalization. So FISH traditionally has been applied to both DNA and RNA. And uh, in another related work, which uh, Professor Kostkang actually introduced nicely two weeks ago, uh, we applied it to RNA, and this is the MERFISH technique, right? And here, uh, we can use multiplex sequential FISH to image 100 to 1,000 distinct RNA species in single cells. The key here is like we, we don't do 1,000 rounds of hybridization. We actually do the combinatorial barcoding. So now, uh, first, first of all, each RNA species is still labeled with a library of uh, these oligonucleotide probes. But uh, we, we have actually four different, different kind of uh, secondary sequences that can bind to uh, each RNA species. So this RNA species is designed to show up in not just one round of secondary imaging, but actually four rounds of secondary imaging. And let's say we have 16 rounds in total of this uh, sequential fish, and an RNA species shows up in four rounds of them, then that actually gives us uh, 16 choose four kind of combinatorial barcode and the 16 choose four combinatorial barcode can allow us to image and distinguish thousands of RNA species. Um, and here's essentially the imaging idea. Um, if the RNA shows up in one round of fish, we consider it to have uh, digit one, like in that round of readout imaging. Um, in the next round, if it doesn't show up, then uh, that bit is zero. And the third round shows up again, that bit is one. And after n rounds, you have an n digit binary barcode. And based on your uh, code book design, you can know, okay, this, this barcode corresponds to GNA, a transcript from GNA, and this barcode corresponds to a transcript from GNB. Um, and this is what the real data looks like. We basically image, bleach, and image again. So um, like each imaging is, of course, what we do with hybridization of one, uh, particular um, secondary probe, we image it and bleach it and hybridize the next secondary probe and do so on and so forth and finish all rounds of uh, hybridization imaging bleaching steps. And to show the um, uh, full demonstration, here's one cell. And in this region, there are several molecules. And this molecule number two here, we see that it shows up in hybridization round four, hybridization round seven, Hybridization round 10 and round 12. Uh, so we know its code is 0001001001001000. And by design, we know that molecule number two here is EGFR. And there is, we also built in uh, an ever robust um, uh, encoding scheme into this technique so that even when we have a single bit error, we, we can actually correct it. This is uh, basically in a coding scheme borrowed from telecommunication called Hamming distance uh, coding scheme. Um, all right. So uh, when I was on the job market, when I was giving the job talk, this is my last slide. And I showed uh, that uh, I was listing that the chromatin tracing technique is supposed to be compatible with co and fish. And I showed it's compatible with co-immunofluorescence. So we expect it to be broadly applicable to different cell types, cell states, in both cell cultures and tissue sections from different model organisms. And this is exactly uh, part of our current work. And in a new technique uh, called MENA, we basically try to integrate and expand this high multiplex DNA, RNA, and protein imaging and apply to mammalian tissue section. And we developed this technique with several uh, biological questions in mind that I talked about at the beginning. One of them is in the native tissue environment. How is the genome folded in 3D across different lens scales, right? Not just tads uh, to chromosome, but also smaller lens scales. 
in single cells of different types uh, and states. And also, how is the 3D genome folded in relation to other nuclear components, such as the nuclear laminar and the nucleolus? And certainly, how are the 3D genome variations uh, uh, among the cell types and states associated with gene expression changes? So to answer these questions, in the first application of MENA, what we uh, do is we image the following components. Um, on a chromosome folding level, we trace the spatial folding of uh, whole chromosome 19, uh, all 50 tiles of them, and we pinpoint their positions and then link them into these whole chromosome traces. And then within the TAD, we actually zoom in and then do a much finer scale tracing, targeting tens of consecutive 5 kb genomic loci. And these loci are upstream of an essential gene called SCB2 that is essential for fetal liver development. Um, and this upstream region have several cis-regulatory elements, and we actually don't know how this region is folded uh, in fetal liver in different subtypes. Neither do we know how the chromosome, whole chromosome is folded. And then on a cellular level, we actually image the nucleolus and whole nucleus so that we can actually profile all these genomic loci, their spatial proximity to nucleolus or uh, nuclear laminar. And then we also imaged 137 different RNA species. 55 of them are cell type marker genes, and the others are genes along chromosome 19, so that uh, we can distinguish different cell types. We also image the cell boundary so that we can really segregate individual cells. Um, and we can do uh, transcriptome analysis in relation to the genomic folding. Um, and here I'm going to quickly go through some raw data, and then we're going to quickly go to the um, uh, biological findings. And here is some raw data of the large chromosome 19 whole chromosome traces, a single chromosome 19 traces shown here. And here is an example of the very fine scale cis regulatory region folding of the SCD2 gene with 5 kb genomic resolution. And here is uh, uh, immunofluorescence labeling of a uh, uh, nucleolar marker gene so that we can extract a nucleolar uh, shape and the depth staining of the whole nucleus so that we can extract the uh, proximal laminar uh, distribution. Um, and then uh, we combine it with MERFISH to image the 137 different RNA species. And here's the MERFISH workflow again, uh, based on combinatorial barcoding. And we read out these bits with different rounds of hybridization in a decoding procedure. And here's some raw data. And here is one field of view on our microscope. Uh, and each dot here is a single molecule and different color corresponds to different RNA species. And we further image the cell boundary so we can segregate this into individual cells and we get a single cell transcriptome full profile from this. And now with the single cell transcriptome profile, first thing we did is to distinguish the cell types. There are actually multiple cell types in uh, fetal liver. And uh, okay, I'll go jump through the validation. We distinguish the cell type using uh, essentially the same workflow that people usually use for analyzing single cell RNA seq data. And here you are seeing the TSNE plot where each individual dot is uh, corresponding to a cell and uh, uh, all the colors correspond to different cell types. And we distinguish these cell types based on um, uh, Lavangia called clustering and the marker gene expression level. And we see that the marker genes, they are enriched in the corresponding cell types. And that SCD2 gene that I keep on seeing about essential for fetal liver development, people know previously it should be highly enriched in hepatocytes. And our data faithfully uh, captured that too. And now with the cell type all identified, we can start to ask, what is the cell type specific chromatin organization in the system? And first of all, we looked at the SCD2, cis regulatory region, and in that region, um, we see that there are several group of enhancers, and th that these are uh, the orange box shows you the uh, annotated predicted enhancers. And here is the SCD2 promoter in red, and which one or one of them interact with SCD2 in hepatocyte, or whether some of them interact with SCD2 promoter in hepatocyte at all is unknown. And with our technique, we can actually test that, right? So we grouped all the fine scale chromatin folding traces in hepatocyte together. And we grouped all the other traces together. And we plot this mean spatial distance matrix from these traces. And we see that uh, the distance between locus 19 
and the locus 16 in habalocyte is much smaller than uh, the corresponding distance in the non habalocytes the locus 19 is actually corresponding to this promoter. Locus 16 corresponds to this particular enhancer. So from our fine scale traces, uh, we seem to see that the, this enhancer contact the corresponding promoter. And from our traces, we can also ask what is the contact frequency between these two points. And, uh, and we show that indeed the contact frequency between locus 16 and locus 19 is enriched in hepatocyte. Um, over non hepatocyte So this shows that amina reveals the fine scale chromatine folding and it shows the cell type specific promoter enhancer interaction uh, in fetal liver hepatocytes. And then we looked at our larger scale chromatine folding. Um, and at that scale, we know there is AB compartment organization schemes, right? And we analyzed the cell type specific AB compartmentalization. And again, this is the compartment score. And we see that from one cell type to another, there are quite a lot of differences in um, its uh, um, compartment assignment and the, and the absolute value of the compartment scores. Um, however, no matter which cell type we look into, we find that the individual copies of chromosome, the AB compartments, they are polarized and organized in this side-by-side -side, uh, fashion. So that is uh, conserved from human to mouse and from uh, different cell types. Um, and because in our Murfish library, we have tens of uh, genes that are on chromosome 19, we actually can ask uh, between a parent of cell type, when we see changes in its compartment score, does that correlate with the gene expression changes? And here is uh, the relationship. And we see that when you have a threefold increase in expression from one cell type to another, it's very likely that gene is in a region that have an increase in its compartment score. So uh, switching between compartment B to A or the whole uh, TAD becomes more compound A-like. So that is uh, correlated with an increase of gene expression. However, a change in compartment score does not always indicate there has to be a change in gene expression. So this means basically the um, AB compartment organization uh, is associated with, but does not solely de determine or dictate gene expression. So with these, we conclude that uh, we can discover cell type specific AB compartment schemes with MENA. Um, in fetal liver, and we show their relationship with gene expression changes. And next, we looked at the other uh, nuclear components, right? So what is the relationship between the AB compartment organization with the nuclear loader or laminar association? So here, what we're doing is we uh, uh, measure the ratio or the probability of our tests to be in spatial proximity with either nucleolus or nuclear laminar. And we define these as a nucleolar association ratio or laminar association ratio. And we plot these ratios against the corresponding compartment scores um, of the TADs. Again, um, remember the, the more negative score means compartment B and the more positive score means compartment A. Um, and based on previous studies, based on uh, previous findings, we already know the inactive chromatin is enriched in compartment B. It's also enriched in LATS, uh, laminar associated domains, and the NATS, nucleolus associated domains. So one would imagine the nucleolar association ratio and the laminar association ratio should both negatively correlate with the compartment score. And that's exactly what we see. So in different cell types, we always see this negative correlation. This is true for all cell types we looked at. However, um, one thing we didn't expect is there are actually these systematic differences between cell types, right? So for example, um, here the pink dots shows you data from this cell type called erythroblast. And this blue dot shows you data from this cell type called pro erythroblasts And these are two cell types that are very close to each other uh, in their developmental uh, relationship. However, um, one have systematically higher nucleolar association ratio uh, than the other and higher laminar association ratio than the other. The compartment, the compartmentalization scheme of these two cell types are actually nearly identical, but uh, we see the systematic differences in their laminar nucleolar association. Um, and on the other hand, after I uh, show this AB compartment organization uh, uh, 
in a side-by-side -side polarized fashion several years ago, people keep on asking me, uh, is it because the B compartment here is dragged by the nuclear laminar or nuclear olus? So it's dragged into this uh, polarized organization. With our new data, we can actually check that. Uh, so here we grouped different chromosome based on whether it's associated with laminar or nucleolus or not. And we find that those chromosomes that are not associated with laminar or nucleolus, uh, they actually have similar polarization indices uh, as those chromosomes that do associated with uh, nucleolar, nucleolus or nuclear laminar or both. So this data basically show that the laminar association or nucleolar association are not solely determined by AB compartmentalization, nor vice versa. All right, and finally, we have this really unexpected uh, um, discovery of uh, the localization of genomic loci relative to chromosome surface. So the idea is that uh, uh, we have all the tags in a chromosome, so we can define a chromosome territory, and we can ask whether a tad is on the surface of this chromosome territory or inside, and we can plot this chromosome surface ratio against the compartment score. And we see this upward check kind of shape for all different cell types. And this is showing that for a very strong compartment A tad, like with very positive compartment score, or a very strong compartment B tad with very negative compartment score, uh, those tads are tend to be on the chromosome surface. And the more ambiguous tad, like could be A, could be B, the compartment score is kind of a, uh, close to zero, those are buried on the inside uh, of the chromosome territory. Uh, this is actually exactly opposite to what we expected because using polymer simulation, we can show that uh, based on a phase separation model that's very popular uh, that drives the AB compartment organization. Um, and that, that, that model is essentially saying that uh, TAD A, uh, A TADs tend to interact with other A TADs and B tend to interact with other B TADs so that A, B compartment phase separate. Uh, based on such a model, you would expect the most uh, definitive A TADs and the most strong B TADs. They are essentially the most sticky uh, TADs in the A phase and in the B phase, right? So they should serve as hubs so that other A tests and other B tests can attach to. So they should be buried inside of the chromosome territory. And exactly uh, from polymer simulation, we see the opposite trend, right? It's not an upward check, it's actually a downward check. However, when we further add uh, extra chromosomal interaction, um, stuff on the surface of chromosome or outside of the surface, when they are allowed to interact with the A tests or B tests, the polymer simulation can allow us to recapitulate the observed chromatin organization. So this basically helps us to conclude the balance between the intra-chromosomal self-associating interactions and extra-chromosomal interactions are necessary to establish the observed organization. In summary, chromatin tracing allows direct spatial tracing of the 3D folding paths of chromatin in individual chromosomes in single cells. MERFISH allows image-based single cell RNA profiling and the MENA enables multi-scale integrative nucleomic imaging in complex mammalian tissue and allows de novo discoveries of nucleomic organization in a cell type specific manner. And the manuscript of MENA work is now posted on Bell Archive. And as a summary of the individual biological findings, we find that the AB compartments stable exist in individual autosomes and, and are organized in a polarized fashion. The active and the inactive X chromosomes adopt drastically different folding and compartmentalization schemes. In developing fetal liver, the folding of the SCB2 cis regulatory region and the AB compartments show cell type specific organization schemes that are associated with gene expression. And the laminar nuclear associations of genomic regions are correlated with, but not solely determined by AB compartment organization, nor vice versa. Um, and the tests with strong AB compartment identities tend to localize to the chromosome surface and the balance between the intra-chromosomal self-associating self interactions and extra-chromosomal interactions are necessary to establish the observed organization. Uh, finally, I'd first like to thank uh, Professor Xiao Weizhou, my postdoc advisor, and all my colleagues and co-authors on the chromatin tracing work. And I'd like to thank my current lab members who contributed to the uh, MILA work. And the MILA work was led by two talented graduate students, Miao and Bian Fang here. And I'd also like to thank my collaborator at Yale, Professor Samuel Kass from the Pathology Department. 
uh, in collaborating with us on the MENA work. And thank you all again for uh, attending this seminar. Yeah, uh, so whoever has question, you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can use the chat box. Uh, I, I think I ask a few questions there, and uh, Steve, you, if you want to read. Definitely, yeah. So the first question asked, for, asked by Rong is, how many cells or nuclei can be imaged? So our throughput currently is thousands of cells per run, um, and uh, I think we're close to 10,000 cells per run, and each run is two consecutive days for the MENA work. Um, and how long uh, each run takes definitely depends on how many genomic loci uh, we want to look at. And here we're imaging, uh, let me think, uh, close to 70 uh, genomic loci. That's why it's taking two days rather than just one day. And the second question is, let me see. Also asked by Ron, what is the requirement of tissue sample processing? Okay, great question. So um, our first demonstration is using fresh frozen uh, tissue, cryo-sectioned, and then fixed later with a 20-minute fixation procedure. So it's not a heavily fixed tissue, although uh, currently we are uh, testing, um, adapting this technique to much more heavily fixed tissue because in a clinical setting, actually, that's uh, sometimes required and most times what people tend to do. And the third question from, oh, okay, many questions on here. I'm trying to enlarge the window. Um, from uh, Professor Koskang is, what is the effect of uh, um, histone proteins and their epigenetic modifications on DNA labeling and the chromatin uh, modeling? Can this be incorporated into imaging approach? Uh, indeed, uh, great question. So um, I think this question is multifaceted. One facet of the question, if I understand correctly, could be that, um, so we have different uh, epigenetic state of the DNA, right? Some are, for example, open chromatin, some are closed chromatin. Um, how do they affect the chromatin tracing procedure? Um, is it true that we essentially only detect the open chromatin and not the closed chromatin? So the short answer to that is, uh, it seems we are, we are, we are fine. We can detect the open chromatin and closed chromatin, no problem. I mean, even uh, uh, quite like a constitutively repressed uh, genomic region, the fish do work on them with similar efficiency as the open chromatin. The pr procedure is kind of robust on that front. And another facet of this question is, can we do this epigenetic labeling together with chromatin tracing? Uh, I think that's indeed a possibility, and uh, in fact, we're trying to work on that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and uh, the next question from uh, Dr. Joe Gennaro is, in the 3D plot of the spatial locations uh, of sequential tags, what is the spatial resolution of locating each tag. Okay, um, we didn't report it in the paper, but we actually did uh, quantify that. Uh, in our first demonstration of the chromatin tracing, um, the spatial resolution is uh, after all 20 rounds of imaging and uh, um, all the correction, um, in 3D within uh, 50 nanometer. So that's the localization precision. In 3D within 50 nanometer. Um, and Dr. Yashi Hao, my colleague here, uh, is asking, are there caveats identifying cellular boundary on tissues? Hmm, indeed, a good question. So uh, I think this is, again, a multifaceted question. One uh, as aspect of it could be that, can we use our current uh, cellular boundary like labeling technique on all kind of tissue? Um, the answer is maybe not. So our current technique is based on the lactin WGA labeling. So it's a protein that binds to an acetyl glucosamine um, uh, and some other things uh, on the basically the uh, glycoprotein glycolipid that's uh, on the cell membrane. And you can imagine some cell types actually don't <laughs> have these uh, glycolipid and glycol um, 
uh, protein on the cell membrane. And actually, some of my colleagues uh, were telling me that uh, there are particular tissue that I'm interested in may not support this uh, for certain cell type, for example. Um, but Really, one can think of other ways. For example, uh, uh, we actually in parallel tested labeling um, uh, 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 cat hearing, maybe cat hearing uh, with polyimmunofluorescence that work equally well on fetal liver. So um, there are alternative techniques essentially to do this. Um, and another facet of this question is essentially um, we identify this cell boundary, um, but what if you have um, molecules? that are very close to the boundary, will they get misassigned to the next cell? Um, and indeed, we have had that concern. So when we are analyzing our single cell RNA profile, after we identify the boundary and uh, isolate the cell, we actually do this uh, imaging process called uh, erosion. So we erode the whole cell area a little bit. The dots or RNA molecules that are too close to the boundary, we don't count them. Um, to avoid miscounting molecules from another cell, a neighboring cell, into this cell. All right, um, let me see. Okay, the next question asked by uh, Dr. Dave uh, Nguyen is, have you looked into whether RNA association in cells is co-localized or correlated with localization of non membrane organelles like protein bodies and if this the correlation is dependent on cell cycle or uh, differentiation state i think it's a great question we currently are not uh, checking into this but uh, uh, this is indeed the one uh, very interesting application of the murfish technique in combination with uh, co-immunofluorescence um, to study basically the subcellular uh, single molecule localization of different rna species and uh, next question asked by Kayen is, early high c analysis based on eigenvector decomposition on the contact map suggests that there are further compartment structures apart from merely AD. What do you think based on your imaging analysis? That is uh, also a great question. Yeah, indeed. Um, so after the initial identification of AD compartments uh, from Dr. Iris Lieberman, Aiden, and uh, um, uh, uh, um, your uh, Professor Yop Decker's uh, work back in 2009. Um, and there are later work uh, from uh, the uh, Lieberman Aiden lab that basically uh, show that A can be further divided into subcompartments and B can be further div divided into subcompartments. Um, so we haven't uh, really further digged into subcompartmentalization from our prompting traces yet. Um, and we potentially can. Uh, However, I think to do it robustly, we do need to increase our throughput in terms of uh, how many genomic loci we're looking at along one chromosome. So imagine that we're looking at 50 tests and we're just um, having 50 dots, essentially. And if we're trying to subcluster these into six different subcompartments, um, there may be uh, a lot of noise simply because we are uh, not really having raw reads of the 3D chromatin positions. So this question actually highlights um, uh, like a contrast between the sequencing-based and our imaging-based uh, 3D genomic or nucleomic technique. Again, um, I think Professor uh, uh, Koska mentioned this in his talk two weeks ago. So all the imaging-based technique, um, the benefit definitely like we have directly in situ information. Uh, it's real 3D. It's very easy that we do multiplex the like omics combining genome, RNA, protein features all together. Um, um, and we can do this in tissue without dissociating cells. Uh, but uh, one downside is uh, many times we, we do need to choose our targets and our throughput in terms of how many RNA species we can image, how many genom genomic loci we, we can image is still not catching up with the sequencing based technique. But that's of course one, way, one thing we try to work on and to improve. All right, I think that's all the questions in the chat box. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Wang. This is a wonderful talk. Thank you, Rong. Thank you, Professor Van. Uh, so next week, we're going to uh, come back uh, to the next generation sequencing based spatial omics technology and hope to see you guys uh, next Friday at 3 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.